Hello everybody, I'm Ben Mullen here in Brecon, in the Brecon Beacons National Park, working at home for BIS, the Biodiversity Information Service for Powys and the Brecon Beacons National Park. Welcome to tonight's talk with Paul Harry. It's part of a series of events BIS are running to promote wildlife awareness and to encourage you to put wildlife on the map by making biological records of the wildlife you see. Thanks also to the Brecon Beacons National Park and Cliff Bar, who have supplied the funds to enable us to run this series of events. Check out our website, bis.org.uk, for all our events coming up. Tonight's Beginner's Guide to Camera Traps with Paul Harry is part of the Watching Nature Recover project. And that's a partnership between BIS and the two local nature partnerships or LMPs in the BIS area. That's Powys LMP and Brecon Beacons National Park LMP. If you're taking part in the Watching Nature Recover project, you'll have been or will be loaned a camera trap to enable you to see what wildlife visits your garden or local area through the lens and be encouraged to help put that wildlife on the map by making biological records of the videos and photographs of, that you capture. If you'd like to take part in the project and live, work or are involved in a community group in Powys or the Brecon Beacons National Park, here are the contact details for the project leads. If you are in the Brecon Beacons National Park Local Nature Partnership area, Maria Golightly is the contact. And for the rest of Powys, it's Holly Dillon. You'll see their email addresses there. We're particularly looking for people in North Powys, so Montgomeryshire and Radnorshire. So if you live in these areas, do get in touch with Holly or Maria or myself, Ben, B-E-N at bis.org.uk is my email address. Tonight's talk is part of a trio of events for the Watching Nature Recover project. Here are the other two. In a couple of weeks, we've got a more advanced course on camera trapping to hopefully enable you to get better camera trap results. And then two weeks after that, an event on wildlife recording, so how to turn your wildlife sightings into important biological records. You can find details of these and all our events on the BIS website. There's the address at the bottom, bis.org.uk, and if you head to the events tab, you'll see all our upcoming events on there, including the Adders talk in a couple of weeks. So take a look at those. The overall aim is to put wildlife on the map by encouraging you to make biological records, such as these 500 or so dots on the map, which are actually hedgehog records, biological records of hedgehog sightings in the BIS area, that's Powys and Brecon Beacons National Park in the last five years. It's easy to make a biological record. If you have a smartphone, you can download the Lurk Wales app, is a bilingual app so it's totally in Welsh as well as English or the iRecord app or if you prefer to put your biological records in online on a computer you can head to iRecord online as well or we have our own BIS is wired wildlife recording database that you can use to record the wildlife that you see and if you're involved in the Watching Nature Recover project, you'll shortly receive a information pack and one option on there for the video and photos that you capture on your camera trap is a website called Mammal Web. And we have a project list on there and you'll be able to upload video and photos from camera traps onto that. And then there'll be people called spotters who will have a look through that image and footage and be able to make identifications of the wildlife that you see. And that's really useful if you don't have enough time to go through all your 
camera track footage or you're not quite sure of some of the species that you might capture on there. <clears throat> it's really important to remember the four pieces of information that we need in order to make a biological record and that's the what, where, when and who. So what you've seen, where and when you saw it and who you as the recorder are, so a name to the record as well. And all these records, biological records, are really useful in putting wildlife on the map, especially in today's evidence-based decision-making processes. And that information, such as all these hedgehog records, is used in things such as planning permissions. And because a lot of stuff is now evidence-based, if it ain't on the map, then maybe you can consider that it doesn't exist. So really useful to get records of common species, such as a daisy in your lawn, or the more rarer, such as a kestrel hovering overhead as you driving down the country road or something like that. So um, do record all the wildlife that you see, including hedgehogs. And remember that hedgehogs 20 or so years ago were once really, really common and now a much rarer site. So all those records help us to see that kind of population decline or increase, whichever it may be. <clears throat> and finally from me, just a little bit about this. We're the Biodiversity Information Service for Powys and the Brecon Beacons National Park. So that's the area we cover in mid Wales and we collect and collate and make available all the wildlife records and important sites information for that area. We're actually one of four local environmental record centres covering the whole of Wales. And we work collaboratively together to help put wildlife on the map in Wales and make that information available to people who need it. For example, for writing management plans, for research and for planning applications, making planning decisions. We also support a network of wildlife recorders and species experts, and also encourage people such as yourselves who might be new to wildlife recording and encourage you to join the wildlife recording community in Wales and help put wildlife on the map. So that's all from me. I'm now gonna hand over to Paul, who is going to be tonight's trainer. Paul has an immense amount of knowledge and experience in camera trapping and I'm delighted that he can share that with us tonight and in a couple of weeks as well in the more advanced event. After the presentation Paul and myself will be around for a question and answer session so do put your questions in the chat or ask in person at the end and that can be anything on camera traps, the local nature partnerships or on making a biological record. So over to you, Paul. I hope everybody enjoys tonight's event and we look forward to answering your questions at the end. Good evening, folks. Thank you all for logging in for this introduction to camera trapping presentation. First of all, I'd like to thank Bradley Welsh from the BIS for inviting me to give this presentation and also to Ben Mullen for all the hard work he's done in the background organising the event and if I'm going to be honest he's been organising me as well. My name is Paul and my background is placed firmly in the technology arena and I use the knowledge that I've gained over the years to help me with my main passions, those being red squirrels and pine martins in mid Wales. I used a variety of camera traps, both off the shelf and homegrown systems, and even developed my own feeder that reads and logs microchips implanted in tagged animals. All the views expressed tonight are my own and are based on my own personal experiences. Anyway, tonight's presentation assumes that you are new to camera trapping and it is based on one camera trap in particular that is being made available through the local nature partnerships under the title banner, Watching Wildlife Recover. Please feel free to ask questions at the end of the presentation where I shall do my very, very best to answer them. So without any further ado, I shall proceed with the presentation. In order to find out how camera traps came about, 
we need to take a step back in time to the late 19th century and concentrate briefly on one man. Born in 1859 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, George Shiras III had a passion for hunting whilst growing up, and it wasn't until he was working as a lawyer and a politician that he began to photograph wildlife. In fact, he went on to dedicate his life to photographing wildlife in Michigan and the areas surrounding Lake Superior, and he became an ardent protector of wildlife and initiated the creation of several national parks. The initial phase of camera trapping development is believed to have originated from a method of hunting used by a native Indian Ojibwe tribe. The way they hunted was quite unique. They would put a pan of fire in the bow of a canoe, which would attract animals on the shore to look at the light. Meanwhile, a hunter in the rear of the canoe and hidden in the shadows would only have to aim at the light reflected from the animal's eyes to secure a successful kill. When Shiras discovered this, he replaced the fire with a kerosene light and the hunter with a camera and a flash and he would use the light to find the wild animals on the shore side by the reflections from their eyes, and then expose images onto a glass plate by using a very loud and explosive flash. The next stage of the development leveraged the use of two flashes. The first flash would scare the animals, and the second flash would record the beauty and majesty of the movement as the animals fled in panic. Together with his friend and the engineering genius John Hammer, they went on to develop an automatic method that would enable them to photograph wildlife at night using a series of tripwires that would activate a flash and therefore expose an image onto a glass plate. Nowadays, Shiras is widely known as the father of wildlife photography, and in some circles he's known as Grandfather Flash. But he wasn't the only person to be involved in pioneering wildlife photography, and there are far too many to mention here. But it may be of interest to learn and to appreciate that photography changed the way that we started to understand living wildlife, as opposed to observing dead specimens in museums. The development of camera traps continued through the decades and the technological achievements were mainly led by the hunting fraternity who used 35mm cameras activated by pressure plates, trip wires, treadles and other basic methods of triggering the cameras. But one innovation stands out above all the others, well at least in my mind. Invented in the mid 20th century, the PIR or passive infrared sensor changed the way that we could detect movement. It was originally used in military and security applications, but nowadays PIRs are everywhere. They help to turn on your garden or security lights, detect intruders in your home or office, and more importantly for us tonight, they paved the way to activate camera traps. Over the last 20 years, camera traps have changed a lot. Digital cameras are now used. Improvements in battery technology has allowed for much longer deployment times in the field. We no longer have to use heavy, complicated flash units to illuminate the scene. And mass production of camera traps means that they are far more affordable and now provide researchers with indispensable tools that can be left out in the wild for months at a time instead of just days. And with the ability to take thousands of images instead of just 35 when compared to film cameras. Tonight we are going to concentrate on the camera trap that will be available for loan from BIS and describe all the parts as well as a brief description on how to perform setting up the camera trap for the first time and getting it ready for your first video camera trapping adventure. We will then proceed to install the camera out in the garden in the hope that something really interesting comes along. A more thorough description of both the individual parts and setting up the system will be discussed in the next talk on the 30th of March. So starting at the top, we have the camera and its lens. Typically, these cameras work in one of two different modes. During daylight and when there is sufficient light, they are capable of taking colour photographs and videos. But at night, they will only take black and white images and videos that are illuminated by the infrared LEDs, which we will talk about in the next slide. It is important to take into consideration that the sensors behind these lenses are physically small 
and are not capable of reproducing high resolution images. But they do the job that they were intended for and are slowly improving as technology allows. It is also true that in general, the more expensive the camera, the better the lens and the sensors tend to be. And one other point that is worth bearing in mind is that the focus of these lenses cannot be altered and they are generally fixed at infinity. So you have to take this into consideration when positioning your camera. And I'm going to dive into this in a little bit more detail when we discuss how to install your camera trap. Next, we move down to the lighting system. In order to take photographs at nighttime, or in cases of poor lighting conditions, your scene has to be lit. Most camera traps are fitted with infrared emitters that provide light to the required area. Typically, these come in two flavors, possibly three, low glow or red glow and no glow. The type of LEDs fitted to the camera supplied by BIS are low glow LEDs and are probably the most commonly used. They are the brightest of all the infrared versions and have the longest range. They do have a slight disadvantage though, and that is that they are visible to the naked eye when activated, and being visible means that in some cases, certain animals may become spooked. And another downside is that they may show the location of the camera to thieves who may like to take advantage of an easy steal one dark night. The strength or power of the light emitted from the LED lights can be regulated from within the camera setup menu and has to be considered when installing the camera out in the field. And on this camera, you have the choice of economy, long range or blur reduction. This short collection of clips shows a cautious badger approaching a camera trap with low glow LEDs. Next, we move on to the passive infrared sensor. The passive infrared sensor is responsible for triggering the camera when an animal is detected moving in front of it. And depending on how the camera trap has been set up, a photograph, a series of photographs, or a video will be taken. Next, we come to the photo resistive sensor, and this is used to detect the ambient light levels. When the light levels are low, the infrared capabilities of the camera are utilized. And likewise, when there is sufficient light, the color option is used. And this is an automatic feature of most standard camera traps of this nature. Next to the photoresistive sensor is the motion detect LED. This LED assists the person installing the camera to position it more accurately. I will discuss this in more detail later in the talk during the installation stage. On the other side of the camera is the microphone, and the microphone is purely there to record audio whilst the camera is recording video. On opening up the front panel, you will be presented by all the setup controls and a screen. The screen is used when setting up or programming your system and can also be used to play back recorded videos and browse through captured images. The cameras that are to be loaned out by BIS have been designed in such a way that allow you to also use the screen to help you position the camera. Access to both the battery compartment and the SD card slot is also possible after the front panel has been opened. Photographs and videos are saved and stored on SD cards. The cameras supplied by BIS are capable of accepting capacities of between 4 and 512 gigabytes, providing the cards are classed 4 and above. SD cards are inserted into a spring-loaded slot and pushed all the way in. 
when you release the pressure on the SD card, you should feel the card lock into place. To remove an SD card, apply pressure to the end of the SD card and push the card in towards the camera trap until you feel the spring's action. Then slowly release this pressure and the card should eject far enough for it to be pulled out. On the underside of the camera trap, you can see that we have access to some additional ports. The USB port is used to update the camera trap as directed by the manufacturer. And the TV port allows for you to plug your camera into a TV with an optional cable to view the images or videos held on the SD card. In reality, I find it much easier to take the SD card out of the camera and pop it into a computer and view the files that way. The final port is a 12 volt auxiliary power port that enables you to plug in an extra power source to extend camera deployment times. On the base and to the rear of the unit is a one quarter inch female thread that allows you to attach the camera to a tripod or alternative mounting option. The back of the camera has a strong metal plate with grips to help hold the camera against the tree when the supplied strap is tightened around the tree. A pair of holes also allow for a Python security lock to be used. A clasp on the side of the camera holds the front panel door firmly closed and can also be locked using a suitable padlock. Now we are going to set up the camera trap for the first time. In tonight's talk, I will not be describing the full setup. I will leave that to the next presentation at the end of the month. So for tonight, we shall go through the basics, such as changing the time and date, how to use the controls to change and make selections, as well as how to save your choices. Finally, I will show you how to set up your camera to record video clips and get it ready for your first camera trapping adventure. We're going to be using the video mode because it will give you the best chance of capturing some action, even if it is only your next door neighbor's cat. Setting up your camera trap for the first time is fairly straightforward, if not a little time consuming. To start with, you will need your camera trap, eight AA batteries, and an SD card as recommended in the instruction manual. Open the front cover of the camera by releasing the latch on the right hand side of the camera and pull the front door open. Insert the SD card as shown and then press the eject button. The battery tray will partially eject and it will need a bit of a tug to remove it fully. Insert the eight AA batteries into the tray, observing the correct orientation. And when the battery tray is full, push the battery tray back into the camera and make sure it snaps shut. Once the batteries and the SD card have been inserted, turn the camera on using the on off switch. Within 30 seconds of turning your camera on, press the mode button on the front panel and you will now see three options. Camera setup, which is the main area for setting up the camera trap or programming it. The playback menu, which allows you to view images or videos captured onto the SD card and provides you with a quick option to review your images out in the field. And the home screen, which takes you back one to the main screen. You can select one of these options by using the up and down arrows on the keypad and selecting that option by pressing the E key. The E stands for enter and is used throughout the setup procedure to save or commit your choices. With the camera setup option highlighted in yellow, press the E key to continue. So the first thing to do is to set up the date and time. So make sure that setup date and time is highlighted in yellow. And once again, press the E key. Before proceeding to change the date and time, it's probably worthwhile to mention that the date format is in the US format, i.e. it's month, day, year, and that the time is displayed in the 12 hour format. So it will be necessary to remember to alter the AM or PM to reflect the correct period. Using the up, down and left and right keys, set the clock to the correct date and time. When you're happy with the time and the date, press the enter key. You will now be returned to the main setup screen. Press the down key once to highlight operation mode in yellow and press the enter key. You will now see that you have three choices, trail cam, video and time lapse plus. 
Press the down key to highlight video and press the enter key. The video mode is now active and the display reverts to the camera setup screen. So we'll need to press the down arrow key twice to highlight video length and press the enter key. You can select whatever duration you want here, but please bear a few things in mind. The longer the duration of the clip, the larger the file sizes will be and more space will be required on the SD card. And if you constantly record long video clips, the batteries will be depleted a lot quicker. For battery conservation reasons, the maximum clip duration that can be taken at night time is just 20 seconds, and this cannot be exceeded. My preferred length of video clip is 30 seconds, but that is very much a personal preference. So for now, I will select 30 seconds and move on. Use the down arrow to select video quality and press the enter key. You now have two options. Both of these options record video in full HD. The high setting allows for you to take videos at 30 frames a second, whilst the ultra setting allows you to take videos at 60 frames a second. High is absolutely fine for most scenarios, whilst the ultra can be used when you wish to slow down the clip in editing. The ultra setting creates very large file sizes, so unless you really need to create slow-mo type videos, the high setting is more than sufficient in the majority of cases. The next setting we have to change is the photo delay. So using the down key, highlight photo delay and press enter. Before we make a choice here, I'm just going to briefly describe what this setting's for. The photo delay allows allows you to enforce a period of time that the camera has to remain inactive for after a photograph or video is taken. Set this delay too low and you are likely to get far too many single species images or videos. Set it too high and you may miss several opportunities. And we can use this feature to our advantage in certain situations. If the camera is to be left out for an extended period of time between checks, or if we are experiencing false triggers, we could use a longer delay. If we are doing short-term surveys where it is imperative to monitor everything that happens, then a shorter delay could be used. This is one of those settings in reality you may have to tweak from time to time. Normally I check my cameras on a frequent basis and I tend to initially set a 10 second delay and make adjustments as I go, but it does depend on what and where I'm doing it. For those of you who are just starting out in this hobby, you could start with a one second delay. And if you find that you are getting far too many images or videos or experiencing false triggers, increase this value until you find a happy medium. So for now, select your delay and press the enter key to continue. Next, we are going to set up some features that are common for both the trail cam and video modes. The first of these is the temperature units. So use the down key to find temp unit and press the enter key. Both of the universal units of measurements are available and you can choose whichever standard you are happy with. The temperature will be displayed on the image data strip that we shall discuss a little later on. Choose your preferred option and press the enter key to save. Press the down key once to highlight the camera name and press the enter key. The camera trap name comes into its own when carrying out multi-camera surveys and you have a need to be able to differentiate between different camera traps. By default, the name camera one is given to all units of this make and model and can be changed if desired. Using the left, right and up and down keys, you can assign a meaningful name if you wish, but for the purposes of this evening's talk, we shall leave it as it is. This name is also displayed on the image data strip. Press the mode button to escape from this option and return to the camera setup screen. Press the down key once to highlight the image data strip and press the enter key to continue. Here we have two simple choices, on or off. 
If you select on, then a data strip is attached to the foot of all images and videos captured on the SD card and provides valuable information such as temperature, camera name, and the time and date that the photograph or video was taken. If set to off, the image data strip will not be visible and you will have to employ other methods of discovering what time the file was created, so it's probably best if this feature was left on. Select on and press the enter key to return to the setup menu. Next we'll move down to the motion detection, so press the down key twice and press the enter key. Here we have two options. The 60 foot range is ideal for when you're putting your camera trap up in woodlands or small gardens, whilst the 80 foot range is ideal for wide open spaces. So select the 60 foot range and press the enter key to save your changes and return you to the setup menu. Press the down arrow and select battery type, then press the enter key. Set this option to match the type of batteries that you installed earlier on and then press the enter key. Press the down key to highlight trigger speed and press the enter key. There are two options here. The normal option has a 0 0.7 second response time and is ideal when monitoring slow moving animals in wide open spaces. Whilst the fast option has a 0 0.4 second response time and is ideal for monitoring woodland tracks for faster moving animals. As we're concentrating on putting camera traps in our gardens this evening, we shall select the fast option and press the enter key to continue. Moving down, we come to the default settings option. Use this option if you want to set your camera trap back to factory defaults. Remember that you will have to set your camera up again for your preferred settings. Now scroll on down to the delete option and press the enter key. Selecting yes will delete all of your images off the SD card and reformat it. It's always a good idea to perform a delete all each time you insert an SD card into the camera, but always remember to back up your files before doing this. Press the down key two times and press enter to set up the IR flash power. The IR flash power setting is used to regulate the output power of the infrared emitters. On this camera, you can see that we have three options, economy, long range and blur reduction. Economy is used in locations such as woodlands and is the most power economical option. The effective maximum range of this option is 60 feet. The long range setting on the other hand is ideal for wide open spaces and its effective range is up to 120 feet. A point to note here is that by using this setting, you will notice a quicker degradation in battery life. Blur reduction is used in the trail cam mode and forces the camera to take photographs with the fastest possible exposure time in an attempt to reduce blurry images. We will select economy and press the enter key. We have now come to the end of the setup procedure for this introduction talk and we will now move on to installing the camera. When you start using a camera trap for the first time, I suggest you start out by giving it a go in your own back garden, as this will allow you to practice and not only get used to the way the camera behaves, but also how the wildlife reacts too. And this will hopefully get you ready for more ambitious camera trapping forays in the future. Depending on where you live, you may be pleasantly surprised at what is lurking around your garden, especially at night. If you are like us, you will have bird feeders that not only help our avian friends, but also attract small mammals that will hoover up the leftovers that get scattered below the feeders. Before putting the camera out in the garden, you will need to consider, one, the best place to put the camera in order to have the best chances of success, and two, how you are going to physically place the camera or attach it to something that allows you to point the camera in the right direction. You will know your own garden better than anyone else, and if you have been watching for or you suspect that wildlife is using your garden, then hopefully you will already have a great idea of where to begin. If not, looking for signs such as hedgehog or fox poo may be a good place to start. 
And when you have a basic idea where you think these animals are going in your garden, you then have to decide how to physically place the camera in the best location to start gathering the evidence. If you have already received a lone camera trap from BIS, you will notice it came with a strap. This strap is used to secure the camera to a tree, a post or something similar. And whilst this is ideal in many cases, you will soon discover that you will need to find alternative ways of securing it in position. For now though, we will start with the strap and progress to some alternative methods in a few minutes. Before we start though, let's have a quick look at the strap. If you look at the clip buckle at the end, you will see that one side is flatter than the other. It is important to make sure that this flatter side points towards the tree or post, otherwise you will end up having to re-thread the strap through the loop. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, thread the strap through the loops on the rear of the camera and pass the strap around the tree and put the free end through the buckle. Be careful here as the spring on the buckle is quite strong and the spikes are very sharp and it can hurt if you inadvertently allow the clasp to shut on your fingers. Tighten the strap as far as you can and if you have any strap remaining keep wrapping it around the tree to provide some extra strength. Tuck any loose ends out of the way just to keep it tidy. Not everyone has a suitable tree in their garden to strap a camera to, and even if you do, the chances are the tree will be in the wrong place. Using a ground spike can overcome many placement problems, and BIS has a number that can be supplied with the lone camera. There are many variations of ground spike and they come in various sizes, but they all allow you to set your camera trap up in various soft ground locations around your garden, including the middle of your lawn. The examples I have here have two sections. The lower section is drilled or pushed into the ground, whilst the upper section is screwed into the one quarter inch female thread at the base of the camera trap. The upper section is then pushed into the lower section, adjusted for height and finally tightened with the knurled knob. The final mounting option I will discuss this evening and that is a tripod. For those of you who don't have trees, and who would rather not drill holes in your lawn with spikes, a small tripod is more than sufficient to mount a camera trap. There are many low cost tripods on the market and I would probably advise a cheap option as leaving tripods out in all weathers will ultimately render them inoperable. So there is no point in spending too much money. Like the ground spike, the one quarter inch female thread at the base of the camera trap is utilized. Regardless of whether we are carrying out a full-blown survey in a woodland or just trying to find out what animals are visiting our garden at night, the basic principles of how to place the camera trap are exactly the same. In all cases, we need to try and work out how the animals move around the environment and we use that knowledge so that we can leverage the main strength of the camera trap and that is the passive infrared sensor. Passive infrared sensors work best when detecting the movement of heat as it moves across the front of the sensor from either left to right or right to left. So to get the best results from our camera trap, we position it pointing at a track or route that we expect the animals to move along. If you don't know if you have any animals visiting your garden, you may initially have to guess where to put your camera and work out what creatures use your garden and the routes that they use from the evidence that you gather. But that's all part of the fun. In our garden, we knew that hedgehogs were visiting because of the poo on the lawn. So we started by placing a camera in front of a feeder. That worked. So we then put in a small pond and that worked too. From there and over the course of several weeks, we worked out how and where the hedgehogs were getting into the garden. And now that we know the routes the hedgehogs commonly use, we can use that knowledge to help us place a camera trap in such a way that it will give us the greatest chances of success. The camera trap that has been loaned out by BIS works best when it is positioned at least six to eight feet away from where you hope to see animal movement.
As discussed earlier, we can use several methods to mount the camera, and although these mounts are very different, the process of pointing the camera at the right place is essentially the same. When we install a camera trap, we basically have to consider two different technologies, the camera and the PIR. Whilst this might sound obvious, what isn't as obvious is the fact that the camera and the passive infrared sensor don't necessarily have the same field of view. And just because the camera is pointed at the right place doesn't necessarily mean that it will be triggered when you expect it to. Luckily, the camera traps that are loaned out by BIS have two useful facilities that can help you to get some good results. The first is the TFT screen located inside of the front cover. When we turn on our camera trap, you may remember that there is a 30 seconds delay before the camera becomes active. Before it becomes active, however, it displays an image of what the camera can see. So we can use this to help us position the camera and point it towards the correct point of interest. Whilst watching the TFT screen, either tilt or rotate your camera until you are happy with the direction it is pointing in. A quick tip, if you start running out of time on the countdown timer, press the mode button twice to restart it. When you are happy that the camera can see what you want it to see, you will need to perform a test to see if the passive infrared sensor will detect movement where you want it to and activate the camera trap. And this is where the second facility comes into play. The motion test facility gives us a visible tool that can be used to see if the passive infrared sensor activates where required. And it gives us confidence that the camera will work when something enters the area that is being monitored. It comes into its own when the camera trap is positioned in either wooded areas that might have obstructions between the camera and the monitoring area, or when monitoring wide open spaces and working with greater ranges between the camera and the scene of interest. When the motion test facility is activated, a red LED on the front of the camera will light up every time it detects movement of heat within the monitoring area. So with the camera positioned and pointing towards the correct point of interest, turn on the camera and press the mode button to enter the main menu screen. Select camera setup and press the enter key. Now scroll down to motion test and once again, press the enter key. You now have two options using the down arrow key, highlight on and press the enter key. The motion test facility is now active, and when you walk or move in front of the camera trap, the LED will light up every time the passive infrared sensor detects you moving in front of it. While observing the LED, a walk test can then be carried out in the area that is being monitored to make sure that the camera will activate when expected. And if it doesn't, the camera position can be tweaked to get better results. Generally, this is known as a walk test, but you also have to consider the size of the animal or animals you are likely to detect. So sometimes this walk test could possibly be described as a crawl test. When you are happy with the motion test, return to the camera and press the mode button three times to turn off the test and put the camera back into its 30 second countdown timer and therefore its active state. Close the front door and let the camera get on with its work. How often you check your camera is up to you and may largely be dependent on what you are monitoring. If you are monitoring an active bird table, for example, you are likely to get a lot of results very quickly and may have to manage the data on a regular basis. But if you are trying to see if foxes visit, you may have to wait a while. Either way, there is a simple way to see if your camera trap has recorded any videos or photographs for that matter without having to move your camera or remove the SD card. If you open the front door of your camera trap, you will notice that the screen is off and there are no visible indications as to the operational state of the camera trap. If you now press the mode key once, the screen will come to life and the Browning logo will be briefly displayed before the camera enters the main screen with the 30 seconds countdown timer ticking down at the top right of the screen. 
At the bottom right of the screen, you will see two sets of numbers separated by a forward slash. The number on the left indicates how many videos or photographs have been taken, and the number after the slash indicates the remaining capacity. If any videos have been recorded, you could, if you wish, quickly review these on the screen by pressing the mode button once to enter the menu screen and selecting the playback option by pressing the down key once followed by the enter key. You can now use the left or right keys to scroll through the videos and when you come to one that looks interesting, press the enter key to watch the video. When you have finished reviewing the results, press the mode key twice to return to the main screen and then turn the camera off with the on off switch. Now it's time to review and record your findings. First of all, you will need to remove the SD card from the camera trap and to look at the contents of the SD card, you will need either a PC, a Mac or a compatible tablet computer with a relevant SD card reader. Some smart televisions may also be able to play the videos or display the images that have been recorded, but you will have to check your manufacturer's instruction manual to see if this is possible. And a point to note here, some Android tablets and phones are unable to play videos created by the Browning Recon Force Advantage Camera Trap. For this talk, I will assume that you are aware of how to use a Windows computer and that you know how to make folders and also how to transfer files from an SD card to an organized folder structure. Start off by creating a folder in your photographs area. You can call this anything you want, but I generally start by creating a folder with the same name as the survey I'm carrying out. So in this example, I will call mine BIS Camera Trap Survey. Each time I copy the contents of an SD card over to the PC, I will create a new folder beneath the BIS Camera Trap Survey folder with a name that reflects the date I copied the data over. So insert the SD card from the camera trap into your computer and copy all of the files into the folder you have just created. Now that the files have been copied over to your computer, you can now start to have a closer look as to what has been recorded. What I do is to play each video in turn and write down the relevant information of each video into a pre-prepared document. This is a personal preference, but I find it works for me. And once I've finished going through all of the files and have recorded all of the information, I delete any of the videos that do not contain any animals or videos that might have been created by false triggers. Now that I have the initial records of the survey period written down, I have various choices as to what I can do with the data. The first task for me is to transfer the information into my working spreadsheet for safekeeping and to provide a historical reference. This information is then shared with the relevant parties participating in the survey. For those of you who have borrowed a camera trap from BIS, they would be really grateful if you could share your records with them, either via using the Wired BIS Wildlife Recording Database or by using the Lurk Wales app. You can also share your data by sending in your findings by email or by using the BIS simple online recording form. For more information on how you can send through your findings to BIS, please visit their website at bis.org.uk. We have now come to the end of the talk for this evening. I would like to thank you all very much for listening to me and I shall leave you with some camera trap footage I recorded back in 2019. If you have any questions, I will be more than happy to answer them, if I can, after the short film has completed.
Brilliant. Right. Thanks so much, Paul. That was wonderful. And I love watching the clips at the end there. That's <laughs> the second time I've seen them, but yeah, they're very beautiful images you've managed to capture there. Obviously not in your garden, but... Um, no, not quite. <laughs> ...or in the project that you're involved in with Prime Martin's Red Squirrel. So that's brilliant. Yeah, we're not getting very much in the garden at the moment other, other than the neighbour's cats, but the yeah. uh, hopefully the, <laughs> the hedgehogs will be out soon. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Brilliant. I hope everyone enjoyed that. That was a wonderful, um, wonderful presentation. And I hope that it enables you to use camera traps a little bit more easily. There are a lot of controls there, but once you start getting into the camera trap and figuring out what all the different buttons do and what all the different features are, they are pretty easy to use. Now we've got quite a few questions here, so I've jotted a few down and then I'll have a search through the chat as well. A couple of people, including Francis Gillatley and Graham and Jackie, have asked you, Paul, if you have a favourite camera trap. Is there one that you always <laughs> I knew this was to? coming. <laughs> um, I have got a favourite camera trap, but I haven't got it yet. Um, it was only launched about two weeks ago, um, and it's going to be appearing in this country shortly. Um, it's the, the it's the it's a Browning camera again, but it's called the Browning Recon Force Elite. Um, from what I've seen of it so far, the video quality and the picture quality is just fantastic. Um, Every year, year on year, the improvements are just phenomenal with, with Browning, the, the make Browning. Um, and you've got to bear in mind, they're doing this for the hunting fraternity. They're not doing it for researchers like us. But the Browning Recon Force Elite is the one I'm going to buy next. Let's put it that way. That's good, yeah. One that you can't have is always the favourite. <laughs> um, we had a question from Heather, who is in the US, I think she said, that she'd like to um, find out a bit more about the project. And she, this may be a question more from Maria, who made the initial decision, but I think Maria's had to leave us during the presentation. Uh, what made us choose this particular camera that you featured in your video? So I'm not sure whether you might be able to offer any advice, Paul, or reasons why. We actually chose. Can I be one. honest? I think yeah. you pro I think you probably got it got it for a good price. Yeah, there was a good discount involved. Yeah, <laughs> I know that much because there was quite a few cameras bought. Yeah. It it's not the one I would have chosen personally because it's <clears throat> it's an old camera. Um, it's I've had mine for sort of between three and four years now. So I've got about four or five of them, and they're about three or four years old now. So um, they've been there's been two iterations since then the browning recon force edge and now the browning recon force elite so my, you know i can't keep on spending money every year personally because it all comes out my own pocket but you probably got it because of the price break the break point you know the price point yeah um and heather also says that she's going to buy this particular camera the browning recon force advantage but i guess you would recommend buying a, a more recently made model as, uh, as i said before i would buy the elite personally um it's the the image processor inside the camera trap is much much better at um, upscaling the image with, with these cameras you have a, a very small sensor so on the typically they're about two to five mega megapixel sensors and what these companies do they upscale the images to 
maybe 20 megapixel in size and they use an image processor in the camera trap to do that and they're getting much better at doing so nowadays so you're going to get a much better um, image quality response time you're going to get a, an all-round better camera than the sort of three or four year old recon force advantage that's not to say the advantage isn't a good camera it's been a I, I found it a really reliable honest camera and it's it's provided some great results for me as you can see by that pine martin film a lot of it was done with the recon force advantage and um, it's just that things do improve over time don't they i mean innovation never stops and another kind of favorite question do you have a favorite brand or type of battery the double a's that you put in there Right, I would always use Energizer Lithium batteries in camera traps that can take them. Not all camera traps can accept Lithium batteries, but in the Browning cameras definitely use Lithium batteries. And the reason before, behind that is if you put alkaline batteries in, if, if you imagine putting an alkaline battery in a torch and you switch a torch on and you leave it running, the batteries go dim. So what happens is over a period of time, the batteries deplete and, and the power gets less in an alkaline battery. And it causes all sorts of issues with camera traps. They can, they can have intermittent behavior problems like they can cause false triggers or you can get blurry images. But lithium batteries, Energizer lithium batteries, they will keep their full power right up until the moment they die. They're good in cold weather and they last longer. So always lithium batteries in equipment that is capable of handling it. And you'd never use rechargeables? I do use rechargeables, yeah. yeah I use rechargeables, especially in my garden camera traps because I've got easy access to those cameras. I can, if, if a battery starts running out, I just dip out to the garden, change the batteries over. But most of my cameras are 40 miles away and it's an eight, it's an eighty mile, mile round trip. Um, they're in a hor they're, they're in an area of Wales that constantly rains. It's not the nicest place to get to, and especially during the last twelve months, you've wanted something the you know the batteries to last a long time. So, hence the reason I'd always use lithium batteries where I had to. Okay, we had a comment from Claire Boyce who uses any loop rechargeable batteries. Any loop? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're good. I've got Eneloop myself. In fact, my light up there is being powered by Eneloop rechargeable batteries, Panasonic. They're good in cold weather. They're as good in cold weather as the lithium energizer, but the lithium energizers just work for longer and longer. I did a survey. The, the, the project I was filming, those Pine Martins for that last bit of film, the cameras were up for nine months. Nine months with no battery change. Wow. I think that says it all. Mm. Definitely, yeah. Um, Francis also asks about the bait that is used for the Pine Martin project you're involved in. Nowadays, I don't use any bait at all. Um, I used to use eggs. and I do use eggs now from time to time, but I'm starting to, what, what I've been doing over the last 12 months is not to use lures or baits because I want to see what's what the natural ecology is in a woodland i want to see how how it behaves naturally um so i try wherever possible to reduce the the, the use of food nowadays um i and i don't like i've got a thing about when they t tell people to use custard creams and all that i, I i've 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 sort of um I'm sort of backing away from putting food out, although I think I'll probably start using lures, which will be in sealed containers, so they, they get attracted to it, but they can't eat it. Um, mm. So, they okay. all pine martins, all pine martins love eggs. That's what I think. <laughs> That's the bait to use, if you don't mind using eggs, okay. Um, you'd be glad to hear that Cheryl has messaged to say that she really enjoyed your talk, along with lots of other people. And she, managed to set, and she managed to set up her camera whilst watching. So very Excellent. informative, very informative um, talk, obviously. Um, somebody, I can't remember who, I didn't write the name down. I'll have a look. Is there any particular camera that you'd recommend for a beginner to someone who has never picked up a camera before? It's all down to budget, isn't it, really? Um, 
let's have a look. I've got one here. Where is it? Ah, oh, there it is. Hang on, just give me a second. I think the, the cameras that were featured in the presentation retail for about £130, 30, maybe? £130, 130, £135. Yeah. Um, I bought, um, I don't know if you can see it, I bought this one just before Christmas. This is, um, I bought it on a Black Friday deal. It cost me £35. Wow. Um, I wasn't expecting it to last more than a week in my Pine Martin area, but it did it did okay. It's not the best camera in the world. It certainly doesn't give you the best results. But I bought this from a very famous online retailer from South America with the same name as a very long river. Um, and it's okay. It's, it's a throwaway bit of kit at the end of the day. If it breaks after a month, throw it away. Um, but um, I would always go for the Browning because they've got, especially with certain companies who sell them in Wales, you get a two year warranty with them. So I think it's possibly worth spending a little bit more, extra, you know, a bit more money on them uh, to get that reliability. And there, there aren't many cameras easier than the Browning to set up. Okay, that's a good recommendation. Thanks for that. Maya is asking about setting up cameras and other than, the, other than your own garden, where would you recommend that they're placed? Um, obviously, if you're putting them in a public place, then they're more visible to members of the public, which might not be a good idea. Watch episode two, two weeks' time. Yeah, that, that's a good that's a good lead into that. Yes, join the talk in two weeks, because you'll learn a lot more about where to place camera traps. So, yeah, I think, well, basically, you can put them anywhere. It's up to you, really, to decide where they yeah. might be safe and where you think they might be wildlife. First things first, I mean, you you... If you're going to put them on anyone else's land, get permission. And so that's probably the most important thing. The second thing is just get to know the area, sit down on a riverbank and look to see what's going on. Look for tracks, look for signs of poo, scat, sprains, whatever. Look for tracks. You know, they're, they're, you go into any wood, you'll see a track moving through a wood. You, that anywhere's, you know, a potential spot to put a camera. So, um, yeah, permissions are the biggest thing, and then and also not to put it somewhere where it's likely to get stolen. Yeah, I'm um, talking of the Recon Force Browning Recon Force Elite. Um, this person Marie has put HP four. Is that a slightly more advanced version of that Elite Browning camera? HP HP four. I don't know that one off the top of my no. head. Um, anyway, the the shop that she mentions on the chat is nature spy which is the company in north wales that we actually yep. bought the from. yeah yeah and it's yep. she says it's on there for 169 pounds so it's quite a big outlay but as you say lasts a long time it? yeah and there, there are two there are two versions of the elite there's the the low glow led version and then there's a no glow led version and that's 20 pound more right okay um claire boys used to use bushnells and i've got a bushnell camera here but think that the Brownings are a much better choice so maybe I don't think agree. there's I don't think there's any camera trap for the price point that matches the Browning for its video quality mm -hmm. okay how about the Aldi cameras which Nick asks about are they any good I'm sure they're cheap never bought ne never bought one <laughs> can't recommend it I don't know them I don't know them. Oh, okay that's great um I made, a I made a decision a long, long time ago. I bought a Bushnell. It never worked for me. I gave up camera trapping. Two, two years later, a friend of mine in Caffili bought one of, one of the predecessors of this one. He put it up in a campsite in the Forest of Dean on his first night. He got badgers, foxes. He got all sorts. He got boar. And I, sa I said to myself, I can't have die beating me at camera trapping. <laughs> so I went and bought my first browning from Amazon for 90 quid. It was an out of date camera and I've never looked back. Oh, that's great. Bit of competition set you on your way. <laughs> of course, I have got some very, very high end quality camera traps that are completely and utterly out of the price bracket. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. There was a question I noticed about how you got the color footage at night. And I assume it's using one of those um, 
Yeah, they're 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 sort of home homegrown camera traps. They're um, they're either digital DSLR cameras or high end four K video cameras with special sensors um, and lighting systems. So the sensors will set off the camera, and the camera will set off the lighting system, um, and you can program the sensors to wake up flashes before they get to the detection zone so everything's ready for the for the animal and you can even put infrared beams down it will only take a photograph of an animal goes through the infrared beams in one direction so you don't get any bum shots so um, there's a lot of really complicated stuff up there out there and it's that's a completely different topic to talk about to be honest yeah, so, yeah. So. An another another event maybe maybe yeah give me give me a, about seven months to prepare the video for that one okay. that's a big one that is <laughs> okay uh demi asks what she says hello so hello demi um hello. she asks hi demi what advice would you have for using a gh4 now that doesn't mean anything to me but maybe it does to you okay so for using photographs or using a GH4 for photographs with a, as a camera trap, I wouldn't bother. The GH4 is okay for 4K video camera trapping, and you probably noticed in the film at the end I did use a GH4 camera trap. The downside to the GH4 is it takes quite a while for the Panasonic GH4 to wake up and start video, and by which time quite often the animals actually moved out the way um, and I know that because I generally put up a, as a, a browning camera trap close to it so I can see what happens um, so the GH4 is an option um, I've found a better one that better option than that and that is um, I use I use this little devil now um, it's a little Sony camera plugged into a different sensor and that gives me 4k video and i find that a bit quicker than the gh4 the, i get i i, ha, I, I as i say I, I have used the gh4 but i found it too slow um and i was missing too much with it so um, I've, i use this now okay thank you is that like a sony kind of a gopro it's a sony rx0 mark ii they're about 800 quid but don't tell the wife <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, then, then, you've gotta, then, then you've got to put a then you've got to put a sensor on top of that. That's another couple, two, three, four hundred pounds. Then the lights. That's another couple of hundred pounds. So you're yeah. looking at the best part of fifteen hundred pound by the time you've set that up for the first time. So um, it, it is um, an exp the pine martins you saw on that log in the video and in the talk. They were done with that little tiny Sony. Um, you know, it's it. it to get that sort of footage is just wonderful. I, I love it. I absolutely adore seeing, yeah. being able to get it, um, but it's a heck of an investment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Very rare to see that. It was, it was really nice. Yeah, the Thank wonderful you. footage. Talking about all this kit out in the wilds, uh, Alison Delaney asks, is it worth investing in a secure box? She has a Python lock, but what is still worried about theft. Okay, so whatever security you use on a camera trap whether you use uh, a security box with a python lock and padlock if somebody really wants to damage your computer uh, damage your camera or steal it they will they i think what i tend to do is i try to hide them in plain sight nowadays so i camouflage them so i'll pick up moss and put moss drape moss all around the camera trap so it camouflages the, the the idea is to to break up any straight lines so that people walking past won't see a, a, a very very straight line so i tend to hide mine in plain sight i don't even use security anymore because well the mice like, seem to like eating the python the plastic off the python lock so that's a bit of a waste um I tend not to do it anymore and I look for places that basically have a low footfall. Um, the, the, the harder places are to get, you tend to have less public walking around. So that's what I, how I approach my security, if you like. 
Yeah, and Maya comments here that she's got a budget camera from that longest river in South America retailer that we all know. And it was a, yeah. it was a gift, um, just in it by itself. Obviously not the best quality, but she still managed to get some good results. Fox, badger, rabbits and a buzzard. So you don't need to spend yeah. big money and you can still get good results. No, that's right. And I think the, the, the problem comes when it's people like me who have a problem, to be honest, because we want to get so so good a quality video or good quality photographs that when we start to look at the cheaper camera traps, we see how grainy the images are and how many blurred photographs you get. And you get a little bit frustrated because you know there's better out there. And I think it's just some of us strive for better image or better images. But if you're surveying, sometimes those better images aid in IDing the species a little easier, because if your image is really blurred, you can't ID an image. You can't ID a, spe a species per se. So, um, you know, these, these cheap cameras, they do the job. They're fine in people's gardens, absolutely fine, but they're not a survey camera. Let's put it that way. They're not a survey camera. Yeah, unless you get something obvious like a badger, maybe, or something like that, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, if you're going to be doing long term surveys, I, I did a, a red squirrel survey over um, the other side of Kinordi back in 2017, 2018, using the predecessor to this camera. And if you remember the winter, that winter was quite harsh, wasn't it? And at the end of the winter, every single one of these cameras, the clips failed on every camera that was 15 cameras went basically got written off so you know it's it's they're not survey cameras right okay uh question here from jeff morgan about the batteries and when you change them is there yep. an internal battery in the camera that keeps all the settings so you don't lose your settings when you change battery? yeah if, yeah if you're quick if you're when i say quick if you do it within sort of 10 minutes 15 minutes it's fine but if you leave leave your camera on the side for a month six weeks then the settings will will most likely have disappeared and it all depends on the condition of the battery inside I'll, if you just bear with me uh, I thought I had one here I could show you but the batteries sorry that's the inside of one of these camera traps this is uh, got very big a lot of water damage but that's that's the predecessor to the advantage anyway um the batteries are absolutely tiny the li little um cell batteries that these cameras um use to as a backup to keep the real-time clock running running so they're quite small so if you leave the main power out for a, a, a an elongated time then you will lose the settings but if you take the battery tray out put new batteries in and pop it back in again the settings will be fine yeah uh, that's good to know yeah so be quick but you don't have to be super quick no, no. okay uh i think this might be the last question um and it's about what's the favorite or best thing you've captured whilst camera trapping and that's from alison delaney as well have you got a favorite um, can you beat the pine martins? <laughs> oh, you, you saw a, fo a, a, a film footage, a bit of film, a clip in the presentation there of an otter. And that's in the middle of a woodland. That was, that was quite surprising. Um, I really enjoyed seeing some pole cats last year. They were quite new. Um, when I first got my, my, the first camera trap footage I got of pine martins, I was absolutely over the moon. And I have a problem now in as, in as much as my camera traps pick up pine martins every single night nowadays. And I'm, I'm desperate to try and find red squirrels in this particular area. So um, that would be the, the highlight of the, the sort of five year survey I'm doing at the moment is actually seeing a red squirrel come back into the woodland that I'm monitoring. Mm, that would be nice. Yes, definitely. Yeah. They're not far away. They're about a mile away mm, yeah. <laughs> from where I monitor. Wow, brilliant. Yeah, we'll look forward to seeing red squirrels and pine martins living side by side one day. Yeah, um, it's going to take a while. It's yeah. going to take a while because we the, the pine martin population needs to get high enough in order to keep the grey squirrel population down. So there's a, 
the, the, and the pine martins don't breed very quickly so they might have two or three kits every two years so the population of pine martins is going to go up very very slowly so what um, nobody seems to know the number yet the sort of dense pine, the population density of pine martins have to be at before the gray squirrels either start moving out or being predated it we don't know how long it's going to take but hopefully it'll be soon okay great that was the last question you'll be glad to know so all directed <laughs> at you so a whole load of interesting camera trapping and i think alison summed it up here with the last comment saying that it was an absolutely brilliant evening and she learned Thank loads much. and thanks you so much um so yeah lots of praise for your presentation and i I will agree with all of them, of course. I thought it was excellent and it was brilliant. Thank you. And I hope that we've got a lot more camera trappers out there. And do remember to make a biological record of the images you capture on your camera traps and also of any wildlife that you see. It's really, really useful information to know the wildlife and what lives there. And the best ways to do that are on smartphones using I record or if you live in Wales or recording in Wales use the Lurk Wales app which is an I record app. If you're a Welsh speaker it's totally bilingual so you can record all your wildlife that you see in Welsh which is a great feature or if you prefer to do your recording of wildlife if you prefer to make biological records online then have a look at I record or the is wired is wildlife recording database that's a couple of places that you can record the wildlife that you see online and all those records help us determine what wildlife is, lives where and enables us to put it on the map um, a lot of decisions that are made these days are evidence-based so if that dot if that hedgehog isn't on the map because you saw it but it didn't get recorded then can think of it as not being there in, in effect so we need to gather the evidence and then pop it somewhere i record look whales app or bizwired and then we can use that information to make important decisions for example planning applications so do have a look at that and do have a look at our wildlife recording course coming up in april on the 14th of april i think it is uh, another one of the series of talks that we've got and you can find out all about our other events at the BIS website, so bis.org.uk. Right, so that's great. Uh, no more questions. Thanks so much, Paul. That was brilliant. Wonderful to see. Thank you very much. Um, we'll see you Thank again you in two speech. weeks' time. <laughs> You'll be back again oh, in two yeah, weeks <laughs> for our getting more from your camera truck, I think you called it event yeah that's so. that's that's a heavy one that's going to be a bit heavier because there's a lot more theory in that one so um you'll need your thinking caps on for that talk <laughs> so a little bit more advanced you've got a couple of weeks if you're new to camera trapping or you're taking part in the watching nature recover project to play around with the camera have a look at the settings see what you can um film or capture on the photo and then maybe come back in a couple of weeks to watch the more advanced talk. Brilliant. One thing which I'd like one one thing I'd like to mention is camera trapping is about patience, having a bit of patience. So just because you're you put your camera trap and you haven't got anything in the first week or fortnight, it could be just as simple as moving your camera to the other side of the tree or moving it 10 foot. Just have patience and look and just be just play around with camera positions because sometimes it makes a little bit of a difference mm -hmm. yeah and uh, the other things well in your talk paul you said that bis had some uh camera stands that you'd spike that you'd stick in the ground all oh, right yes but you were getting them if you haven't if you haven't got a tree we haven't got any yet but if you are part okay. of that watching nature recover project and you haven't got a tree in your garden or a post or something suitable then um, do get in touch with us and we'll see what we can do to help out with a, a, a spike or something like that. We haven't got any yet, so if you want to try and devise your own, that'd be great, or obviously you can buy your own, but if you really, really do want one and you can't actually get hold of one, then do get in touch with us and we'll see what we can do, because we're 
hoping to get lots of lovely biological records from this. I'll just post my email address on there, which you can contact me by, and any messages for Maria, who's the Powys Local Nature Partnership Coordinator, or for Holly, who's the, sorry, Maria is the Brecon Beacons National Park Local Nature Partnership Coordinator, Coordinator, and Holly is for the rest of Powys Local Nature Partnership, then I can forward those messages on. So that's great. It's managed to finish before nine o'clock, which is great. Um, hope you all enjoyed that and have a great rest of the evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for taking part in the Watching Nature Recover project. You are involved in that project and do get in touch with Holly or Maria if you want to take part and hopefully we'll get more people involved in that wildlife recording project, watching wildlife through the screen. So thanks so much and maybe see some of you again in two weeks time for the more advanced talk on camera traps with Paul. That's brilliant. Thanks so much Thank everybody you. and good night. Thanks Ben.